Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrew Altfest. At an event to celebrate the 35th anniversary of our firm, you will hear tonight what opportunities we're finding in 2018 for all of you and the investments we are making to do even more for our clients. This is our fourth firm leaders panel, but the first one with 15 years of the firm that I am no longer the newbie on the panel. <laughs> so thank you, Mayuk. <laughs> Let me introduce the panelists. Ekta is a director of our firm and head of our financial planning. She's also a member of our portfolio action group and she joined the firm in 2000. Mike is a firm leader, panel veteran, and a director of the firm, and he joined the firm in 2001. Mayuk is a researcher and portfolio manager at Altfest. We first started working with Mayuk in 2015, and he came to Altfest with many years of experience. So let me just briefly go over the panel format. Everyone on the panel is going to share timely information with you. Then we're gonna turn it over to you, the audience, for Q&A. But this year, given the, the size of the audience, we are going to, for both panels, collect your questions. So you will find a pad uh, that was given to you. And if you have a question, write it down on the pad, put your name uh, next to the question. And so just in case we cannot get to your question, we will be sure to know who to follow up with uh, to answer your question after the event. Raise your hand um, when you've written down your question and someone will uh, come around and collect the question and, and bring it up um, for, us to, uh, for us to answer. So Mayuk, as the newbie on the panel, why don't uh, you go first? Okay, um, good evening. It's great to see all of you here. And uh, I was having a chat with Mike right before and as a newbie on the panel, he said that I should uh, get up and shake a leg. But uh, I'll spare you that. And uh, I'll probably just talk to, talk to you about your portfolios, which is probably a lot more interesting topic to you. Uh, so what I want to do today is share with you, give you kind of a behind the scenes look at what happens to the life of your portfolio at Altfest. A tremendous amount of thought and care goes into from the time the portfolio is conceived to how it grows over time to ensure our final objective is to make sure that the portfolio meets your goals and your objectives. And a tremendous amount of effort and care goes into that. Uh, every decision that we make in terms of whether a change is made in the portfolio or if no changes are made in the portfolio, in either case. There's an extensive amount of analysis, research, and deliberation that go into the process. Uh, before I go into the process, I want to spend a little time talking about the objective. And that starts with you. Each of you, when you come in, uh, you, you have set an asset allocation target in consultation with your advisors, where you tell us what's the level of percentage of equity or equity-like investments and bond and bond-like investments that you're comfortable with having in your portfolio. In the long run, and I probably cannot stress it enough, that this is the single most important decision that's going to influence your investment outcomes, be that be the risk in the portfolio, or the returns you get out of the portfolio. So I'd strongly urge you that from time to time, revisit that with your advisor to make sure this is still the right allocation for you. And especially if there's a change in your financial situation or in your personal goals, please make sure to communicate with your advisor to make sure that you have the right allocation for your portfolio. So given that allocation, what is our objective, the investment team's objective, what do we want to do? So our objective is very simple. It's twofold. One, protect your capital. Two, grow your capital. And how do you go about doing this? So very recently, Andrew and I um, 
had a conversation with a very large endowment about our investment process. And I think at the end of the discussion, what they told us is that you guys are very different as, as investment managers. We typically don't meet managers as active as you are. And you have the track record to back up your style. So how do you do it? Uh, so I think the answer is really twofold. One is process, and the other is people. Let, let me talk a bit about the people part first. So we have an incredible bunch of people who spend a lot of time in doing research to make sure we have the right investments in your portfolio. For example, our investment strategist, Sush, uh, who happens to be my wife, uh, she, spent, she has been a senior strategist with one of the very large investment banks uh, doing building strategies, analyzing global macroeconomic uh, markets for about 10 years before she joined Altfest. And the model and the strategies she built were used by the bank because the bank acts as a counterparty to a host of really smart hedge fund managers and money managers. So the strategies she built, the bank used them really to make sure that when they act as a counterparty to all of these very smart people who have a lot of market intelligence, they still end up making money. And now we have her, so we can use that intelligence to benefit your portfolios. But it's not just Sush, it's not just me. We have a team of 10 very talented analysts, each of whom are responsible for looking at a very particular part of the market. And they look at it, analyze it, both our existing investments and our new investments, our opportunities in those areas, and bring that intelligence into your portfolios. And to tie it all back together, we have the Portfolio Action Group, which is led by Lou, where we meet every two weeks to look at your portfolios to see what we have in the portfolio portfolios, if this is appropriate given our market outlook. So the key tenet of what we try to do is really look at risk and return in a single, uh, in an integrated fashion. What do I mean by that? Uh, think of your portfolio as a collection of different risks. Uh, like you have, we have the risk that the U.S economic growth might be very strong, in which case the portfolio do well. We have the risk that foreign exchange markets might behave very erratically, and our international investments may not do as well. Uh, we have risks related to interest rates. So our job is to try to understand what is the trade-off between risk and reward, and what are the kinds of risk, and in what quantity we want to have them in our in your portfolios. Uh, and we do it every day. We look at the markets continuously to make sure that your portfolios are positioned appropriately given what we are observing in the markets. Um, and yeah, I think our final goal is to make sure that your investment portfolios do what you set them out to do. And if you have any questions, or any concerns, you should always talk to your advisor and make sure that your asset allocation is right and uh, if, if any changes need to be made to that. Uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll end up here and I'll hand it over to Akta. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Um, you got some insights into how we manage portfolios from Mayuk. What I like to talk about a little bit is highlight uh, some of the conversations we are having with clients uh, in terms of uh, financial planning discussions and how that discussions and thinking is evolving at Altfest in general over the you know, last few years. Um, the few points that I want to really make uh, tonight is in relation to spending. In general, this is still, you know, on top of the charts when we meet with clients, they would like to know whether they are thinking of retirement or whether they are in retirement or whether they are taking break from their careers. This is something that um, people um, do seek help in uh, figuring out how to go about thinking in it. And uh, this is uh, we, where we spend time uh, in collaborating in the meetings with clients and almost coaching them and walking you through uh, what's uh, necessary in terms of achieving uh, that goal of what's that appropriate amount of spending. And the spending can be related to, um, you know, 
just having a comfortable retirement to goals like leaving a legacy for your heirs or just thinking about uh, long-term care expenses and so on and so forth. Um, when we meet with clients, for instance, we ask, generally ask them to think about, you know, first question would be, how do you think about your expenses and how, do you, how will they change in retirement, for example? And it's, we often find that it's something difficult for clients to really think about in that perspective. So more, what we started doing is sort of encouraging them to think about how would they like to spend their time in retirement? Because once they are able to think about how they want to spend their time in, in their retirement, they're able to sort of, you know, connect the dots and think about, you know, how, what that expenses would look like. It's almost like sort of thinking about, uh, you know, two aspects and how to balance those two aspects. One being time, how, what would you like to do, and which is more qualitative, human aspect, and the other is money, which is your financial aspect, and how do you balance it? And, and what is your risk tolerance in terms of uh, how do you want to balance them? So for example, are you in the camp where you would like to spend more money earlier in the retirement doing things you love to do, versus are you in the camp who are more conservative and would have a more balanced approach throughout the retirement. So, you know, and we find, you know, the answers are different for different people. Some people prefer traveling earlier or spending more money uh, on their grandchildren and children earlier in life. And the others feel that they want to be more prudent just in case towards the end if there are more long-term care decisions and expenses that they may need to worry about. So there's no particular um, right answer. Our job is to f help you figure out, you know, from you to understand what your goals are and then nav help you navigate really through the quantitative aspect of achieving those goals. And with spending, I think another thing that comes uh, into our conversation more often, uh, recently in last few years, relates to your later in life expenses, by which I mean long-term care expenses, elder care related expenses. Um, certainly, you can never know if you're going to need long-term care or not, but we want you to be in a position to plan for it while you are able to make those decisions. So, in, t in terms of making those long-term care decisions, there are a few things that we tell our clients to think about. One is, um, have you thought about what would you want for yourself, given your values? Do you have some concerns about your health that may affect those elder care decisions later in life? For example, what are your inclinations in terms of uh, being at home, being taken care of at home versus being in assisted living or nursing home? And, you know, what would that cost? And more importantly, do you have somebody in mind who you can designate to be a healthcare proxy for you, somebody who you can trust, somebody who's able to take on that responsibility for yourself. These are some very, you know, important and to a certain extent uh, difficult decisions for a lot of people to make. And once you kind of know what you want in terms of your values with long-term care, ultimately really it comes down to expenses in terms of how you're going to pay for it. Are you going to pay for it yourself out of pocket, which is really self-insuring? Or do you have an insurance or are you looking to buy insurance? Or finally, you know, are you planning to qualify for Medicaid? The insurance landscape, for example, has changed quite a bit more recently in long-term care, care space. And we at Altfest have spent uh, quite a significant resource in understanding the new uh, new products that are out there, such as uh, hybrid products with life insurance and long-term care versus their traditional long-term care. There's a lot of nervousness out there about the traditional long-term care industry where the premiums have significantly gone up, really. So our job is to, um, you know, understand the pros and cons of having one versus the other and what might be, you know, applicable for our clients in their particular situation. And, but the good news is we can really help you through this because we've uh, spent a lot of time understanding uh, this particular aspect of the long-term care industry. Uh, the other um, topic that I would 
uh, touch on that frequently comes up, which relates to about estate planning in our conversations uh, with our clients. And here I would just like to share what we see as some of the oversights <laughs> in this area from our side of the table. So most people, when we meet with, really understand uh, the importance of having an estate plan in place. However, often we realize that there are gaps, either it's incomplete or it's not followed through um, in the way it was intended to be followed through. So for example, let's say your goals changed, so does the law. The laws have changed so many times in just the last 10 years. And uh, maybe your assets have grown over the years, your investments might have done well, that now you might have to start thinking about estate planning in some way or the other. But let's say you lived in New York when you last did your estate plan and now you've moved to another state. Now th that's a situation where you want to meet with your estate attorney and think about how that would have affected um, your plan in general. Um, the other thing we find that people, um, as I said, uh, do with estate plan is they create a nice estate plan but often enough they fail to execute it. So a good example that of that would be creating a trust uh, you may go to an attorney and uh, depending on your situation, they may recommend you to create a trust uh, for the reasons, uh, you know, such as ensuring your assets are managed properly if you're incapacitated or to avoid probate or what have you. But for those goals to be met, you have to actually transfer your assets into the trust. And we often find that the trust, these trusts are created, documents are created, but the assets are not transferred. And this, this is what we deal on uh, regular basis, we ask our clients periodically, you know, what does your estate plan look like? Does it reflect what your current thinking is? Uh, when was the last time you checked in? And that's how we are able to find those gaps and talk with you through this process. Um, some, in the same way, we find that beneficiaries are not updated often enough uh, while having our conversation, whether it's on your retirement accounts or in insurance policies, et cetera. So that's why we are periodically, you'll find a lot of our advisors checking in with you to say, hey, you know, this is what your beneficiary looks like on your portfolio. Is, does that reflect your current thinking? Um, one other thing most people think uh, of an estate plan is sort of planning for death. And that's really simply not true. In fact, um, you know, an unex unexpected illness or a disability may affect severely your assets uh, while you're alive than in death. So it's important to think about, you know, the documents that are needed to be in place to help you. God forbid such event may happen with you. Documents such as, you know, power of attorney, uh, which Mike really talked about last year, or importance of having a power of attorney. Um, healthcare proxy, which I touched upon why it's important to have that, especially when you're thinking about long-term care for yourself, create a living will, etc. And And finally, um, you know, this may sound very obvious, but trying to keep all those documents very accessible. It's very important that these documents are located when they are needed, because in the event, if you can't locate them, the court may treat it as if you never had the plan in the first place. So, you know, I think um, it's, it's, it's vital that people know and have talked to their people in charge, such as executor or what have you, to let them know where these documents are in general. And as with long-term care, we've also spent, we are spending actually significant time in understanding and building out our estate planning processes at our firm. So we're working with an attorney to figure out different planning areas within the estate uh, arena that we can help our clients with. So if you have, uh, you know, any of these topics that we can help you with, uh, let's uh, put it on our agenda in our next meeting and we are happy to discuss that with you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Okay. So, uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> excellent, excellent actor. So, uh, it's great to see you all tonight. And uh, as you may know, as some of you may know, uh, here at AltFest, our mission is to optimize all aspects of your personal financial lives to give you the peace of mind and the, uh, to give you peace of mind in general and the ability to do what you want to do. When I say your personal financial lives, of course, this means investments, but it also means your retirement planning, taxes, estate planning, 
insurance, pretty much anything that falls under the guise of personal finance. You know, part of our process, though, to optimize all areas of your personal financial lives is to keep up to date, as Ecta was talking about, on important changes that are happening in all areas of personal finance to identify financially advantageous strategies for you. You know, when we reviewed the client surveys that you completed for us last year, uh, interestingly enough, one of the most requested planning areas uh, with which you wanted our help was reducing your taxes. So because of this, tonight I'm going to talk about two strategies connected to reducing your taxes and charitable giving. The first strategy uh, I affectionately like to call clumping charitable contributions using donor-advised funds. Uh, three points on that. One, that's a mouthful, so I'm not going to say it again. Uh, two, um, I'm going to explain what a donor-advised fund is a little bit later. And three, for those of you uh, with whom we've discussed donor-advised funds before, um, the Trump tax plan has made it important to take a second look at them. Under the Trump Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of December 2017, the standard deduction was substantially increased, which is good news. Um, but they also, the act also capped and eliminated some itemized deductions. And this capping and losing of some itemized deductions meant that most people uh, in 2018 tax year will be taking the standard deduction. But if one takes the standard deduction, any charitable contributions that you make in 2018, with one exception, uh, will not help reduce your taxes at all. The exception I'll talk about a little bit later, this is what they call a financial planning teaser moment, just to <laughs> let you know. <laughs> so to help you maximize the tax benefit of your charitable contributions, we recommend where appropriate that you clump your charitable contributions for multiple years into one, where appropriate. You know, clumping charitable contributions into one year every X number of years could allow your total itemized deductions to exceed the standard deduction amount in the year of the clump. And by doing the clump, your charitable contributions will help reduce your taxes versus providing no tax reduction benefit at all taking the standard deduction. So what's a donor-advised fund? A donor-advised fund is simply a legal vehicle, a legal container that makes it easier for you to, you guessed it, clump charitable contributions into one year. When you clump charitable contributions for a couple of years into a donor-advised fund, you're able to claim the full amount of the charitable contribution in one year, but you do not have to distribute the whole amount of the clumped, of the clumped contribution to your favorite charities in that tax year. You can keep doling out the same amounts per year as you always have, but by using a donor-advised fund, you get to use your contributions to reduce your tax bill. And if you want to even add like icing on top of the cake to get even more financial bang for your charitable contributions, if you have investments um, that have greatly appreciated in value, uh, they are an excellent candidates to transfer over into this donor-advised fund vehicle as you can contribute to charity the full amount of the current value of the investment while avoiding having to pay any taxes on any of that appreciation. Your charity will thank you, your tax bill will thank you. The second tax beneficial charitable giving strategy I want to talk about is using qualified charitable distributions or QCDs for short. A qualified charitable distribution or QCD is a charitable contribution you can make from a traditional IRA account once you reach the age of 70 and a half. The QCD goes directly to an IRS-approved charity and counts against the required minimum distribution that you need to take for that year if you're over 70 and a half. While you don't get to take a charitable deduction on your tax return with a qualified charitable distribution, it can be better than donating to a charity from a taxable account and then taking the tax deduction on your return. Why is that? Well, for two main reasons. The first is, like I mentioned earlier, under the new Trump tax law, you will not get any tax-reducing benefit 
from charitable contributions from taxable accounts unless the total value of your itemized deductions is above that standard deduction threshold. And two, while you cannot take a charitable contribution against, I'm uh, sorry, you cannot take a charitable deduction, I should say, against your taxes with a qualified charitable distribution, the QCD amount does not count as income against your tax return as a required minimum distribution does. By lowering the amount of your taxable income by making the QCD, you may be able to reduce your taxes overall as some taxes go into effect, as you know, at higher levels of taxable income. For example, social security income is taxed at higher rates depending on what one's modified adjustable gross income. Or you may be able to claim more in itemized deductions. For example, uh, if your adjustable gross income is lower. So for example, itemized deductions for medical expenses can be claimed if they're over 7.5% of your adjustable gross income. The lower adjustable gross income you have, because maybe a lesser amount of required minimum distribution, the more of that itemized deduction you'd be able to take. But remember, the 7.5% threshold is a special government tax offer for a limited time only, for only for 2017 tax year and 2018 tax year. Starting in 2019, that floor of 7.5% of AGI goes up to 10%. So if there are any discretionary medical expenses that you want to take or thinking of taking, 18 would be a good year as, composed, as compared to 19. So as I said at the beginning, wrapping up my remarks, our mission here at Altfest, which we're laser focused on, is always to be optimizing all aspects of your personal financial lives to give you peace of mind and the ability to do what you want to do. These are just two, these examples I just said were two, only two, of the many, many strategies your advisors are hard at work evaluating every day to accomplish this important mission for you and your families. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Andrew. Thanks, Rick. In past years, I've spoken about international investing, new investment strategies we've developed, and how we've brought in increasingly talented professionals onto our team to serve you. But for our 35th anniversary, I felt like we needed something bigger. I decided I need to talk about Altfest and artificial intelligence. <laughs> okay, I see some surprise faces. So let's start with Altfest and technology and move on to how AI fits in in a little bit. At Altfest, we're taking a different stance than most firms in the industry. We are using leading technology and developing our own proprietary powerful tools to do more for you. We all know that technology is revolutionizing every possible industry. We want to be at the forefront of change and embrace the opportunity. Don't worry, we're not becoming techie robots. Our relationship with you is and always will be personal and intimate. That is our core value. We use our knowledge of your needs to tailor our work to you and approach your work as if it was our own issue, and we do that through one-on-one -on -one individual attention. Technology allows us to do more for you. It is an enabler of better analysis and more insights. It gets rid of unimportant work in the back office and freezes up to do more for you, more strategic thinking on your behalf. It allows us to identify issues in your finances. It provides more information to you to track your finances and to come up with proactive solutions. Let's start with the basic enhancement, the new My Allfest private client website. In the next few weeks, you will get an invitation to enroll in our new private client website. More than just an investment login, it is a digital financial manager. You can choose to link your credit cards and bank accounts so you can easily track all of your expenses. You can set alerts. You'll be able to see all your investment and bank accounts in one place. There is also a secure document vault so you can store all your financial documents, like your insurance policies, wills, and other estate planning documents, and tax returns. In addition to providing peace of mind, ECTA talked about estate planning and uh, having all of your records in together so that uh, your executors and trustees um, 
who, if they ever need to take over your affairs, will be able to um, easily, knowing where everything is. We at Allfus have a connection to the software, so we can securely share documents together like financial plans and tax returns. If you don't want to share all your expenses with us, and for us to see how many lattes you're drinking a week, you can keep your expenses private on your private page. At Office, we're not limiting ourselves to the technology on the market, though. For example, we developed and have been evolving our own asset allocation system called Total Portfolio Management. This evolutionary method of portfolio construction was first developed in Lou Alfest's financial planning textbook. Total Portfolio Management uses a more refined method of portfolio constructing, construction by factoring in all your assets, not just your financial investments, but your real estate, your earnings potential, um, your pensions, your social security, and it also looks at your liabilities, uh, like your debt, but also other liabilities like your fixed expenses, and looks at them all together, and you can come to some surprisingly different conclusions about the risk that you can take in your portfolio when you do that. Let me give you an example. Think about a tenured professor. That person has very secure income. That income is like a bond. I recently heard a story about a tenured professor who, after getting tenure, dyed her hair purple. <laughs> now, that's what we call job security. <laughs> Contrast that to the highly variable and cyclical income of a husband and wife investment banking, uh, two investment banking clients of ours. When we look at all of their risk in their life, we come to some very different conclusions about the risk that they're able to take in their portfolios. An investment in software will allow total portfolio management to be more widely deployed at our firm. Okay, now for AI. At Allfest, we are adding to the insights into your finances. Today, we, we, we have developed well-defined processes, and I've definitely led uh, the creation of my fair share of them. And we look at common planning strategies that we see among our clients and apply our judgment against your personal situation and identify suggestions. That's what we do today. However, we are building software that in the future will identify what actions our clients in a similar situation to you have also used, and those, rege those recommendations will be generated for us to review and decide whether to recommend to you. Now, where else have we seen this AI approach being applied? Well, Netflix. Netflix, in proposing movies, you, based on your um, classification and your taste, would enjoy seeing. With our input as strategies as a jumping off point, the software will also be teaching itself what planning opportunities for us to consider for you. Sound futuristic? There is a Stanley Kubrick photo exhibition on display right now in this museum, and I think he and his how. Uh, computer, uh, his, his sidekick would approve. The space age is here. We are making a major investment in software to do more for you, combining this with our judgment and knowledge of you. Our investment in technology in this way is something you will not find at other wealth management firms and builds on our tradition of being client first, continuously improving and maximizing the well-being of our clients. Now we're going to uh, turn it over to everyone, um, all of you, for your questions. So if you have a question and you've written it down, raise your hand and someone will come by uh, to pick up your question. The first question that we're going to start with is, can you talk about security around the new Alfest digital financial management? Right, so... Okay. All right, one more time. Okay. Yeah, I, can, I can repeat the question. So the question was about um, security. How do we uh, know that this site, this new uh, Altfest private client website is secure? So we've had consultants look at it. We've looked at the technology, that the security policies they have, and they're using um, military grade technology to secure the site. Um, they've never had a, um, a break-in 
to the site. They've never been uh, hacked. And the, uh, the, the, the software is owned by a very large um, parent company, Fidelity. Um, so the, the software is, um, you know, is, has, has passed all the tests for, uh, for security for us. And that's why we feel comfortable um, um, rolling it out to everyone here. Right, one thing I would just briefly add is that, as Andrew said, they're using military grade security. So this is much stronger than the security that is required by law for the major financial institutions, such as Chase and um, you know the various banks and, and investment banks. What about Equifax? <laughs> they weren't using, uh, I don't believe they were using military grade security. And I think uh, they're also trying to run simulation to hack into their own systems mm -hmm. as, a, as a safety guard to try to see how, how many different ways you can hack into your system. So that's, you know, they're constantly thinking about these things. Our next question is around decision-making decision -making process at the firm. Can you talk about how the president's decision-making process affects the investment decisions at Altfest? <laughs> Okay, so I think uh, geopolitical uh, risk is a very real risk, uh, not just the decisions that our president makes, uh, it's also the decisions that the North Korean leader makes in whether he's going to have the summit with our president or not. So those are real issues, real concerns. Uh, but I think fundamentally, we, tra we, when we look at all of these risks, uh, we are long-term investors. And we believe that focusing on the economic fundamentals in the long run is much more important than looking at these geopolitical risks. Some of the political risks that can become very important is if there are policy changes that changes our outlook of what's going to happen to the economy down the road. Uh, some of the concerning stuff that you see right now is increase in the government debt. Uh, we are having a fiscal stimulus sort of through the tax cut and increased government spending, well, one could argue that we are quite late into the economic cycle for the US. Uh, this is something that we haven't experienced in the past, so it's hard to say what the outcome is going to be. Uh, that said, we look at it very clear, carefully and closely. Some of the changes that we've made in our portfolio, if you notice, is uh, especially within our fixed income part of our portfolio. So one of the things when you talk about risk or diversification is that people try, try to think about that bonds are going to be the, as a bucket of investment that protects your portfolio when risks increase. Uh, and we tend to see it in a slightly different way right now. If interest rates go up for various reasons, if inflation goes up, then can actually, then long-term bonds can actually turn into a source of risk. And we, we make changes to, our port to your portfolios based on all of the things that you observe in the market. And I think if you look at your performance, especially for the fixed income part of your portfolio, you'd see that uh, that has actually outperformed the bon uh, general bond indices by quite a bit over the last few years. And we are, we are quite proud of uh, the work we have done on that, on that part. And, and sometimes such decisions uh, or geopolitical risk creates market dislocations and, you know, create opportunities for us for, uh, to take position in, for client portfolio at, at a really, uh, you know, cheap valuations. Thanks. The last question that we have before we move into the next segment is with regards to Social Security. If I'm considering retiring, can you talk a little bit about how Social Security works and some key considerations? Well, that is, uh, that's another one of the many areas of personal financial planning that the advisors here are working hard to make sure that you're optimizing as much as possible. Um, a lot of it's, there's no cookie cutter solution. Um, so what I'll say in general is first, before you make a decision on social security, definitely speak to your you know, primary advisor, your, your team. Uh, to ask for guidance. They might ask for an updated Social Security estimated benefit statement, ask you some other questions to make sure that you're going to get the maximum over your you know, expected life expectancy. Um, one, I'll say just one or two things. One common fallacy is that people think, oh, well, 
I better take what I can now because I might not be around tomorrow. So let's just get while the getting's good. I'll take it at 62. Um, we would not recommend that strategy because, you know, one, you have access to good health care, education. You're probably going to live longer, all things being equal, longer than the, than the average American. Um, and you get a reduction in benefits the earlier you take them. You know, if you take them at 62, you're going to take a, get a significantly less amount per month than if you take them at 66 or 67, and you're going to take even less than if you take them and wait until age 70. So waiting can su su substantially increase your bottom line and give you more financial security, especially if you live a longer life, you'll have more money per month to help uh, meet those expenses. Um, also, another thing to th realize is that Social Security isn't going away anytime soon. So by the Social Security estimates put out by the administration, the Social Security Administration, they think that there's enough currently in the system to match all the benefits that are going to be claimed through around 2031, 2032, and then if nothing changes, that they don't, anything, don't do anything to fix the system, there's about, let's say, 75 to 80 cents on the dollar of benefits that still will be able to be paid out from 31, 32 onwards. And so between now in 18 to 2031, you've got a nice 12 to 13 year runway where people can, where the Congress, the President can make some adjustments if needed to be able to extend the life of those benefits. And the other last thing I'll leave you with is that people who are close to Social Security or are in Social Security, they vote a great deal, and politicians are very aware that they grow a, a vote a great deal, so they don't want to do anything to jeopardize themselves, or I mean your, your social security. Yeah. <laughs>